Thursday, January 24th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. Coming off the New Hampshire primary here, I'm Mo Shwanunu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Uh, Jill, no major surprise last night, but still interesting uh, that this race, it appears, isn't going to be over anytime soon. No, that is the big takeaway. So let's get to the headlines here. Donald Trump wins the New Hampshire GOP primary, but Nikki Haley says this race far from over and vows to keep fighting. And on the Democratic side, Joe Biden wins as a write-in candidate in the most <laughs> symbolic fight. Who's, it's so silly. I can't even report who's it. Who's this Joe Biden guy who, who won as a write-in? We got we to gotta look into this. <laughs> Overseas, the deadliest single day for Israel since the war began. 24 soldiers killed in Gaza will have the latest on the war. Johnson & Johnson agreeing to a settlement in the talk baby powder investigation. Though it's not over for that company anytime soon. United Airlines raising doubts about future Boeing orders after the door popped off of one of Alaska's Boeing planes. The CIA tries to recruit double agents in Russia with a new video. And uh, we are not talking about the TV show, The Americans, here. The piano man, Billy Joel, out with his first new song in nearly 20 years. And some news from Justin Timberlake, who hasn't had a single in a while. Veteran CBS newsman and longtime host of Sunday Morning, Charles Osgood, dies at the age of 91. And Oscar nominations are out. As usual, we've got the snubs and the surprises. One hint for you, Mosh. I'm just Ken. (laughs) Jill, despite the message of the movie, it appears uh, Barbie has another setback. And Mosh has on this day in history. Jill, a little Britney Spears, a little McDonald's, and the first ever can of beer on this day in history. All right, Mosh, for our top story here, Donald Trump won the New Hampshire presidential primary last night, becoming the first GOP presidential candidate to ever win both of the first two states, Iowa and New Hampshire, in a competitive primary. His margin of victory over Nikki Haley, though, not as much as some polls were predicting, around 10%. It is still a comfortable margin, and it continues what looks to be like a pretty easy path to the nomination for Donald Trump, despite speculation from the media that a loss would mean that her campaign is over. Trump's only real rival left in the race spoke to supporters early in the night and vowed to keep fighting. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. my sweet state of South Carolina. So Haley has been making the case that polls show that she is more likely to beat Joe Biden than Donald Trump is in the general election. At one point, saying that the first party, the Republicans or the Democrats, to drop their 80-year-old candidate will win. Still, despite the spin, and Mo, uh, Mo News producer Emily Gross was at Haley's headquarters and said people in the crowd We're loving that. At one point, heckling Donald Trump and Joe Biden about their age. Still, despite the spin, Haley still needs to find states to win. There you go. That's the rhyme going into the next couple of months here. (laughs) Despite the spin, you need to find states to win because if you want to be the nominee, you got to start winning some states. Yeah, they were having fun with the heckling in the Haley crowd, uh, yelling things like depends, yelling geriatric at mentions of Trump and Haley. Um, Remember, this is the Republican primary here. You're trying to become the Republican nominee. Haley's major support here is among non-Republicans. Significantly here in New Hampshire, where she came in relatively close to Trump, right? 70% of her voters were either independents or Democrats, whereas 70% of Trump supporters are registered Republicans. And as you continue through this primary process and you want to be the candidate with R after their name, 
you have to win over a majority of them. And the thing for her right now, as she continues to go after Trump, is she's losing favorability. She's losing support among Republicans. But but what's notable is that she's winning among independents. Where are independents really important? In a general election against Joe Biden. So she's sort of like acing the LSAT, but she hasn't taken the SAT yet and gotten into undergrad. I'm, I'm, I'm liking that analogy, D- so, th- so there you go. She's like, well, I can get to law school. Yeah, but but, but uh, Ms. Haley, you need to win. You need to get into undergrad first by um, doing well on the SAT. The bottom line here is it still appears to be Trump's party. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, pretty clear path to a nomination. Yeah, speaking of Trump, he gave his victory speech a little bit later than Haley, but he spent a big portion of it attacking her for basically taking a victory lap even when she's losing. But she ran up when it was seven. And, you know, we have to do what's good for our party. And she was up and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win. She lost. And, you know... But let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. She had a very bad night. Moshe, it was interesting to see who was on stage with Donald Trump. We're talking Tim Scott right behind him, basically the whole time that he was speaking. And Vivek Ramaswamy, who he, Trump actually let speak for, he, he said for a minute, I think Vivek went on for a little bit longer than a minute, but I think it shows that he, he is trying to prove that the other former candidates are really rallying around him. And his point would be that it's time for Nikki Haley to do the same. Yeah, notably absent, Ron DeSantis, who did file that video endorsing him and uh, clearly by getting out, um, enabled Trump to have a slightly better lead over Haley um, in the results here. But it does not appear DeSantis wants to be hanging out publicly with Trump anytime soon. So David Axelrod, who helped run Barack Obama's campaign, he said, look, campaigns are not like horseshoes. You don't get points for coming in close you've got to actually win. And to that end, Haley mentioned South Carolina is next. As of now, polls show she is seriously trailing Donald Trump in her home state by about 30 points. So Moshe, are you buying Haley's enthusiasm here? Or do you think it is just a matter of time until she also suspends her campaign? Well, she has to be enthusiastic, right? You're not going to bum out your supporters and donors by being like, guys, we really tried here and we didn't do it. Like she is motivated. She cleared the field, right? As far as she's concerned, she won the um, non-Trump sweepstakes. Six months ago, there were a dozen candidates in the field and Haley um, took them all out, including a former sitting vice president and Mike Pence, including multiple senators, uh, Chris Christie, uh, DeSantis, you know, who came in as the you know heir apparent basically nine months ago. And so she's like, listen, I survived this. I have no reason to get out anytime soon. Trump ain't getting any younger. His legal issues ain't getting any better. So what's the hurry, everybody? There's 48 states to go here. And um, you know, ultimately, you know what dictates whether candidates stay in the race? Well, one is donors and, and two is the party. The party will put pressure on you. And by, by the party, I mean, you know, party elders, the, the Trump, the people around Trump being like, listen, Nikki Haley, you're in your early 50s. You want a future in this party? You should consider getting out now. Um, otherwise, you're going to burn yourself. They haven't started really twisting her arm. At least it doesn't appear so. Um, we'll see what comes in the coming weeks. And then you have donors. And if she still has people willing to give her millions of dollars and fundraise for her to put up ads and to run against Trump, then there's no reason for her to get out. You know, she's sort of waiting for the rapture to happen. You know, she's waiting for like a moment, like some major legal issue or Trump to fall over, or, you know, she's starting to make issues of his cognitive confusion, you know, in the, in the moments that he's had um, on the campaign trail. So if she sees that getting worse, then she sees an advantage. And so until he has locked up all the nominees necessary, until he has locked up all the delegates necessary to be the nominee um, at the convention, she see, she is in no hurry here. So let's look at the calendar because one of the big things we'll be watching for in the coming weeks is math. Who has the delegate math? And right now it works to Trump's advantage, right? These first couple states were proportional. She did gain some seats. She, she did gain some delegates. Sorry. She did gain some delegates. At the Republican convention, you need just over 1,200 delegates uh, to be the nominee. Um, so what do we have coming up? Well, in, in February, you have a Nevada caucus and primary. Nevada is very confusing this year, folks. They have a caucus and a primary. Um, if you thought the New Hampshire Democratic thing was uh, confusing, welcome to Nevada. 
where the state scheduled a primary, but the party said we're having a caucus to allocate our delegates. Nikki Haley's only gotten into the primary, so she can say she won the primary. Trump's not in the primary. Trump's in the caucus. Needless to say, he's going to win the caucus. She's not in the caucus. She's going to take delegates from Nevada. Great. Michigan has another confusing thing where they're having a caucus and a primary. Again, works to his advantage. South Carolina um, is a state where she was the governor for six years, but all the major figures in the state have all come around Trump. It's a big Republican state. It's her home state. She says, she, you know, it's sweet home South Carolina, and she's going to do well there. Well, right now, not so much. And by the way, South Carolina politics, very nasty. If you look at pre previous presidential campaigns, you can already see signs that this could get ugly down there. Remember, Trump has already started calling her Nimrata. He's basically othering her. He's birthering her. Uh, you already see rumors online. Well, her parents were born in India, so her parents were born outside the country. So that makes her ineligible to be president, which, by the way, is nonsense. She was born here. She can be president. But you see a lot of nasty stuff happening there. When uh, I covered various campaigns, you know, there were some nasty politics pushed by the Bushes and others against John McCain, where they tried to say that he fathered an illegitimate black child. He adopted a Bangladeshi child, but they made it an illegitimate African-American child, which was done by the Bush campaign to try to harm his campaign. They also said his wife was a drug addict, uh, that he was a traitor for uh, being a POW in Vietnam. Anyway, stuff gets really ugly in South Carolina. So be aware, Nikki Haley, about what happens there. Needless to say, it would be quite a comeback for her to pull off a victory there. So let's say she doesn't win anything in February. Well, what does that take you to March 5th, a Super Tuesday, more than a dozen states? Now, a number of those states are winner-take-all states. And by that, I mean, I said proportional earlier, right? Iowa, New Hampshire, if you got 55% of the vote, you get 55% of delegates. If you get 45% of the votes, you get 45% of delegates. Well, you can be competitive in that way. Winner take all states, if you get 50.1% of the vote, you take home all the delegates. What are those states? Florida, California, also closed primaries where independents don't vote. Well, that's trouble for Nikki Haley. She, you know, So suddenly, Trump's going to have a several hundred delegate advantage on his way to 1,215. That's a problem for her. So math is going to be a problem for her. And that'll be a question people will be asking um, going into March, which is, what is your route mathematically to get to getting more delegates than Donald Trump? So that's where you might start to see some pressure after March 5th. But between now and March 5th, it appears based on what she was saying uh, last night that she ain't getting out anytime soon. Most of the exit polls are pretty interesting here. One thing we have been talking a lot about on this podcast anyway is immigration and the crisis at the border. And it appears that that is an issue that is really resonating with voters. Yeah. In New Hampshire, you can't get further away from the uh, U.S.-Mexico border than New Hampshire. And yet there, among Republican voters, uh, migrants, the top issue, um, both among independents, among Republicans. Um, and you're seeing this across the country. Um, and so that's going to be a significant thing. We've been talking about it for the Democrats. The impression there is that Biden hasn't taken it seriously enough. And it's something that is particularly advantageous for Donald Trump. The question will be, well, can Nikki Haley come up with some more aggressive immigration messaging to curry favor there? Or by the way, has her criticism of Trump burned her with enough of the party? Is there any recovering for her among Republican voters? One other thing uh, I found noteworthy in the exit poll, Jill, eight out of 10 uh, voters who, uh, who cast ballots yesterday in the GOP primary want total overhaul in Washington, eight out of 10, 80%. Um, so again, that is where they view Trump as that candidate, the total overhaul candidate, whereas Nikki Haley is viewed as establishment. So that, again, is another advantage for him. So that's interesting there. And I feel like uh, we're coming up on Groundhog Day, um, Jill. So based on the New Hampshire primary, we have at least six more weeks of primary. So the candidates have seen their shadow. Is that what you're Nikki saying? Nikki Haley saw her shadow and she would like <laughs> to continue. Yes. Okay, motion. On the Democratic side, President Biden won as a write-in candidate. That race mostly symbolic because Biden wasn't on the ballot. Uh, we did a whole walkthrough of why that is, mostly because um, the Democratic Party decided to bump up South Carolina ahead of New Hampshire. New Hampshire said, no, we're going to stay ahead of South Carolina. And then Biden's campaign said, OK, if you're going to do that, we're not going to put him on the camp. We're not going to put him on the ballot. And then they started to panic a bit, thinking it may not look so great if he doesn't actually win there. Yeah. I mean, they were sort of like, well, we don't care about it, but we do care about it. Uh, I would say that they are breathing a sigh of relief at the White House on a number of counts. One, again, they didn't care, but they would have cared if that would have become a media story that he didn't do well. 
two, this GOP fight continues. They're going to keep spending money on each other. So that means the Democrats can continue to preserve. And by the way, Biden has done an incredible job fundraising and let them fight it out for a little bit and burn money on each other. And then significantly, they're watching this independence storyline. The fact that independents keep going with um, Haley here, their holdouts on Trump, and uh, the independence is going to be key in a general election. So the fact that independents uh, are not feeling so hot for Donald Trump so far um, in the vote uh, will give folks hope in the West Wing that like, ooh, I think we have a chance with the swing voters, with the independents um, in November. So they're watching um, this uh, primary on the Republican side um, with a lot of interest and starting to look at some of those numbers that we've been talking about. Okay, now to the latest in the Middle East. Hamas terrorists carried out the deadliest single attack on Israeli forces in Gaza since that Hamas raid that triggered the war killing 21 soldiers. It's adding to mounting calls for a ceasefire. The explosion on Monday afternoon, which collapsed two buildings on soldiers about 600 meters from the Israeli border, raises the military death toll since October 7th. So 21 soldiers were killed in that incident, in addition to three others on Tuesday, bringing the total to 219 soldiers killed since the outbreak of the war. Hamas operatives appeared to have fired an RPG missile at one of the buildings the soldiers were operating in in Gaza. The buildings had been rigged up with about 20 mines for detonation as part of the army's efforts to establish a buffer zone between Israel and Gaza. So that way, thousands of Israelis who live along the border could return home. They're actually still displaced from October 7th. The RPG fire from a few dozen meters away likely set off the mines, causing the structures to collapse and killing 19 soldiers inside and near them. And then a second RPG killed two more soldiers. The Hamas cell then apparently fled. The IDF is probing the security of such operations as well as weighing the number of troops deployed close to and inside buildings that are intended to be demolished. Yeah, this is significant. When we talk about 200 uh, soldiers, may, many, most of these are reservists, uh, meaning that you know they had regular jobs and families inside Israel and they were called up for the war. So uh, this type of death toll has a real impact on a small country like Israel, and it has come as the country has scaled back aerial bombing due to Western pressure, requiring them to do more things on the ground. But then that but then that leads to incidents like this, which has Israelis asking why they're risking soldiers' lives when they can do more things by air. Either way, it has set off a, a mourning period inside Israel. The prime minister uh, speaking out saying that the Israeli military will press ahead until they achieve absolute victory, including crushing Hamas and freeing more than the 100 Israeli hostages still being held inside Gaza, the Israeli military pressing ahead on Tuesday, announcing that ground forces had encircled the southern city of Khan Yunus, that's a Palestinian town, the second largest city inside Gaza. Thousands more Palestinians now fleeing from that city, headed to uh, south of there to Rafah and then Mawasi. Uh, but Mawasi has been declared a safe zone for Palestinians, but now Israeli tanks and troops are headed there, as they say Hamas cells have gone there as well. The death toll on the Palestinian side has now surpassed 25,000. That includes both uh, militants uh, as well as civilians. And the dire humanitarian situation has led to increasing international pressure on Israel to scale back its offensive and to agree to an eventual path for the creation of a Palestinian state. It comes as Doctors Without Borders, which operates at the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus. The organization says that that hospital is now completely full. There is no safe way to evacuate. And so they're calling on the international community to do more uh, to stop the fighting in and around the hospital. As we know from northern Gaza, Hamas has in the past used hospital facilities uh, to uh, base some of their operations. Meanwhile, we told you yesterday about that hostage deal offer from the Israelis. A senior Egyptian official says the Israelis did propose a two-month ceasefire in which the hostages would be freed in exchange for prisoners, in exchange for Palestinian prisoners held in Israel. But as of right now, Hamas has rejected the proposal, insisting that no more hostages will be released from Gaza until the war completely comes to an end and all Israeli troops withdraw from Gaza. We're talking about a couple hundred thousand Israeli troops at the current moment. Uh, the Israeli government has declined to comment on the talks 
after that Hamas rejection. Okay, time now for the speed read from CNBC. Johnson & Johnson has reached a tentative settlement to resolve an investigation by more than 40 states into claims that the company misled patients about the safety of its talk baby powder. Johnson & Johnson has reached a tentative settlement to resolve an investigation by more than 40 states into claims that the company misled patients about the safety of its talc baby powder and other talc-based products. This is according to the company. Notably, the settlement does not resolve the tens of thousands of consumer lawsuits, some of which are slated to go to trial this year, alleging that those talc-based products caused cancer. Those cases have for decades caused financial and public relations trouble for Johnson & Johnson, which contends that its talc-based products and now discontinued talc baby powder are safe for consumers. 42 states and D.C. had launched a joint investigation into its marketing of talc-based products. The company will be paying $700 million to settle the probe. It has previously set aside $400 million for it. Yeah, so they got to dig around for an extra $300 million there, Jill. And they still face more than 50,000 other lawsuits related to their uh, talc products, mostly by women with ovarian cancer. Some of those cases do involve mesothelioma which is a cancer linked to asbestos. Johnson & Johnson recently settled some of those mesothelioma cases from an undisclosed amount, but has maintained, again, that there was no asbestos in their powder. One of their strategies they've they've been pursuing here that's been rejected and they're going to try again is they're trying to resolve the cases by placing all their liabilities into bankruptcy, basically filing for bankruptcy, creating an offshoot. Uh, Right now, so far, two attempts to do that have been rebuffed by the courts, but after its most recent failed bankruptcy attempt, the company uh, says it's planning another bankruptcy filing. And when we talk about settlements here, Jill, we're talking about upwards of $9 billion or more dollars that Johnson & Johnson will have to pay out. Also from CNBC, United Airlines weighing fleet plans without the Boeing 737 MAX 10. After a series of delays and most recently the grounding of a smaller variant of the plane, this is according to United's CEO, the MAX 10 is the largest model of the plane and it has not yet been certified by the FAA. United CEO Scott Kirby saying that the plane is already best case about five years delayed. And he expressed a lot of frustration at Boeing for the most recent manufacturing problem in which a door plug blew out during an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 flight on January 5th, prompting the FAA to ground those planes. Yeah, so there was the MAX 8. Uh, That's flying again after being grounded for a couple of years. We've been dealing now with the MAX 9 situation related to just the MAX 9 uh, variations that have this door plug. That's after the Alaska case. Uh, And then uh, Boeing was finalizing the MAX 7 and the MAX 10 uh, to market, had a whole bunch of orders there. It now appears that United's like, well, we might have to figure out a plan without the MAX 10. Keep in mind, United does have uh, 79 MAX 9 planes, more than any other carrier in the world. And so this will lead to some uh, financial issues for the airline. The CEO, Kirby, saying, I think the MAX 9 grounding is probably the straw that broke the camel's back for us. We're going to at least build a plan that does not have the MAX 10 into it. Uh, Last week, Delta said they are confident moving forward with the MAX 10s. But Jill, this is sort of uh, a repeat of what happened with the MAX 8, where there was one issue, they thought they'd resolve it quickly. The grounding is lasting longer than they thought. Remember, the MAX 8s were on the ground for a couple years there. So United clearly looking ahead here and saying, well, we should have a, a backup plan. From Reuters, the CIA has released a Russian language video to try to persuade Russian intelligence employees to switch sides and work as double agents for Washington. No, Mosh, this is not the plot of a new Netflix series. CIA Director William Burns said in July that disaffection among some Russians over the war in Ukraine was creating a rare opportunity to recruit spies and that the CIA was not letting it pass. The video was released on social media. It's trying to appeal to what it suggests are patriotic Russians working in intelligence agencies who may feel betrayed by corruption in elite circles and the poor way that the Russian armed forces are equipped and supplied. The latest in a series of recruitment videos targeting Russia says those around you may not want to hear the truth, but we do. You are not powerless. And then details ways to contact the CIA. 
The CIA telling Reuters that, quote, we are seeing more outreach from Russians as a result of these videos. So this video actually is like sort of like a mini movie, like a mini TV show. It portrays a 35 year old unnamed uh, Russian male employee of the Russian military intel service who is a patriot for his country, but believes the country has turned its back on him and is uh, giving money and palaces to the rich uh, while soldiers chew rotten potatoes and fire from prehistoric weapons. Honestly, not that far off from what the Russian military currently is facing in Ukraine. So basically, they create this scenario that they feel will be applicable or relevant to the lives of various Russian intel officials. And Jill, this is serious. They put this out on social media channels, uh, Facebook and Twitter, by the way, which, by the way, are blocked in Russia. But if you have a VPN, which I imagine you do if you're an intel official, you can access it. They also put it out on Telegram, which is uh, very big in Russia. Now, you know, the CIA says they are seeing outreach. There's no way to verify that. That's, of course, what the CIA is going to claim. The Kremlin in Russia shrugging this whole thing off. Uh, The spokesperson there, Dmitry Peskov, who's been there for a long time, saying, you know, this practice is quite common. Intel agencies around the world very often use the media to recruit new employees. They do it all the time. The CIA does it all the time. It's not going to work. And by the way, uh, notably, Vladimir Putin, who runs Russia, is a former KGB spy himself who used to serve in East Germany. Uh, And so he's been warning of increased espionage and says, you know, he uh, is on top of this sort of thing. Uh, And they're denying that there's any problems in Russia. Uh, They're saying the military has what it needs. Uh, But I should note the U.S. just declassified an intel assessment that says that the two-year war now in Ukraine has cost Russia 315,000 dead and injured troops. They're falling back on weaponry from just after World War II. So uh, CIA sees a vulnerability here. And so we'll see if this video pays any dividends. And when I say we'll see, we're never going to know, Jill, because we're never going to (laughs) know what (laughs) ages the CIA picked up from this whole thing. (laughs) But it is funny because sometimes the simplest, most obvious strategies actually do work. If you remember, the FBI had been looking for Whitey Bulger for for years and they eventually caught him because they basically just put out like a have you seen this man type of thing. Yeah. And somebody called in a tip and they that's how they arrested him. It's been, I think, about 12 years already. But anyway, it sounds like pretty simplistic, but sometimes this stuff actually works. Yeah, sometimes you'll be watching those like uh, Homeland episodes or those various dramas. You're like, oh, that's way too simple. And the CIA is like, actually, sometimes it's actually that simple. Okay, from NPR, a couple of artists announcing this week that they're releasing their first new music in a while. Singer Billy Joel announced on Monday that he is releasing his first new song in close to two decades. Joel is 74 years old, a Grammy Award winner. His label, Columbia Records, says he plans to drop Turn the lights back on. On February 1st, Joel teased the new song on social media with a short clip consisting of a simple chord progression played sedately on the piano. Jill, you're at Billy Joel headquarters there in Long Island. (laughs) I imagine this is big breaking news at Newsday. Mosh, top story, uh, reported it first, I believe. Um, Weather, (laughs) Weather, traffic, and Billy Joel music updates out there in Long Island. We Long Islanders take Billy Joel quite seriously. (laughs) It has been more than 30 years since Joel released his last pop album, River of Dreams, back in 1993. The final track was called Famous Last Words, and it alluded to Joel's desire to step away from the recording studio. And even though he has not recorded anything new, he has continued to perform live regularly. He tours internationally. He's scheduled to finish up a 10-year residency this summer at Madison Square Garden in New York City, which I have still not been to. And I feel like I am Jill, there's been more than I'm clearly losing my chance here. (laughs) Jill, there's been about a hundred shows. I've seen it. It's great. You need to get out there. Not for nothing. I have said to my husband, this is all I want. (laughs) Like I don't ask for much. You hear that, Michael? Michael, Michael, Valentine's Day is coming up. Get her some tickets. (laughs) Meanwhile, uh, in other music news, Justin Timberlake is also putting out some new music. We learned this week after a five-year drought, so not as uh, long as the Billy Joel drought. He is putting out a new single called Selfish. It's coming out tomorrow, 
Thursday. So he also posted the song's cover art on social media this week. It appears the album, which is his sixth solo album, is called Everything I Thought It Was. And this will be his first solo release since the 2018 Man of the Woods, which, by the way, that album went to number one on the Billboard charts. Uh, And look out for a performance already this weekend. He will be the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. Dakota Johnson will be hosting the episode, Timberlake as the musical guest. And Jill, if you remember uh, previous appearances by Timberlake, he has pretty good comedic timing. So I'm looking forward to some sketches, hopefully, that he won't just be performing the music, but that they will include him in a couple of the uh, sketches. At least a couple of the shorts. You know, some yes. of the fake songs the that they shorts. do. Yeah. Okay, from CBS News, award-winning journalist Charles Osgood died on Tuesday at the age of 91. Osgood anchored CBS Sunday morning for 22 years. So he was the host of the long-running radio program, The Osgood File. His family says the cause of death was dementia. Osgood was a gifted news writer, poet, and author. He spent 45 years at CBS News before retiring in September of 2016 when he was 84 years old. And at the time, he said, for years now, people, even friends and family, have been asking me why I keep doing this considering my age. It's just that it's been such a joy doing it. Who wouldn't want to be the one who gets to introduce these terrific storytellers and the producers and the writers and others who put this wonderful show together? Jill, he was a legend. Uh, I feel uh, honored to have been able to walk the halls of Charles Osgood. Uh, And it was remarkable watching him still record his radio segments, uh, you know, show up to work uh, every day um, into his 80s. And he was actually having trouble moving about uh, and, you know, still insisted on hosting the show. Of course, he took over uh, for the famous Charles Kuralt at Sunday morning, and then Osgood uh, took over, and now Jane Pauley hosts the show. Uh, we refer to him as the poet in residence, and he was just this multi-talented guy in addition to his incredible writing. Uh, Jill, he played the organ, the piano, the banjo, the violin, uh, and could compose and write lyrics as well as sing. So there would be some Sunday morning episodes where he would like sing a song to introduce uh, a various segment. Pauly, who I mentioned succeeded Osgood in 2016, uh, is quoted as saying, watching him at work was a masterclass in communicating. I'm still thinking to myself, how would Charlie say it? Trying to capture the elusive warmth and intelligence of his voice and delivery. I expect I'll go on trying He was one of the best broadcast stylists and one of the last. His style was so natural and unaffected, it communicated his authenticity. His tagline, if you remember it, was always, I'll see you on the radio. Love that. Yeah, it just, and and Jill, he had been around so long that by the time we were at CBS uh, in the 21st century, he had a contract that he was still able to promote things himself. You know, this goes back to like throwback radio of the 1950s and 60s where you'd stop a segment, you're like, and I'm Charles Osgood for Marlboro, for Evian, for Ford Motor Company. So he actually still had that deal where he could promote stuff himself, whereas the rest of us, uh, you know, there was a wall between editorial and sale. So that was something notable that Osgood had in his deal. And the other thing I'll make mention, and I feel like it applies to all aspects of life, but most especially journalism, was this is one piece of advice he had. And he had many pieces of advice. Uh, He was quoted as saying, short words, Short sentences, short paragraphs. There's nothing that can't be improved by making it shorter and better. And that was very much a philosophy at CBS, which is there's no such good th- there's no such thing as good writing. There's only such a thing as good editing and good rewriting. And so less is more. So fewer words uh, means more and can really have more impact. Well, Mo, you know how I feel about that. Because all I want to do is cut, cut, and tighten scripts. That is kind of like my motto, um, short and sweet. But when I was at CBS News as the Money Watch correspondent, I would pitch stories all the time. I'd pitch to you over at Morning News, and I'd pitch at, and I would just on a whim pitch over to Sunday Morning because I would say, if I could just be on CBS Sunday Morning, that's it. My career would be made. I'm done. I, I could retire. I would never have to work in TV again. Unfortunately, it never happened, Uh, but that show, such a classic, particularly because of Charles Osgood. And Mosh, finally from CNN, the Oscar nominations are out. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer leading the pack with 13 nominations. 
Next was Poor Things, the fantasy film starring Emma Stone with 11 nominations and Martin Scorsese's epic Killers of the Flower Moon. That scored 10 nominations. Lily Gladstone, one of the stars of Scorsese's Killers of the Moon, she was nominated for Best Actress, making her the first Native American person to contend for the competing Acting Academy Award. Barbie got eight nominations, but Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig, they were both snubbed for Best Actress and Best Director nominations. However, as I mentioned, I'm just Ken. Ryan Gosling was nominated for a supporting role, as was America Ferreira. If you remember, she had this kind of great soliloquy about being a woman in America and just the and all of the double standards. And perhaps that tipped the judges. Yeah, so Ferreira got the nomination, but still the fact that a movie about the patriarchy doesn't acknowledge the leading women, Greta Gerwig and uh and Margot Robbie in this case is sort of too on the nose here uh, for people. And so there's been a lot of reaction on social media about the fact that the nominations here sort of reinforce everything the movie was trying to message. As far as Oppenheimer is concerned, you mentioned 13 nominations leading the pack, obviously did incredibly well at the Golden Globes uh, recently, which is typically a precursor that gives you an indication of where the Oscars might go. Uh, Christopher Nolan, the director, has never won the coveted Best Picture Award. It's his second nomination for directing. The first came with Dunkirk a few years ago. And as far as the actor who plays J. Robert Oppenheimer, Cillian Murphy, uh, apparently he was at his parents' home in Cork, Ireland, drinking a cup of tea when his phone started buzzing and that's how he found out his uh, and that's how he found out he was nominated uh, telling reporters uh, by phone. It's very, very humbling. I'm still kind of in shock. I don't know how shocked he can really be. He just won the golden globe for his performance, but you know, congrats to uh, Murphy there. Uh, The Academy Awards will be airing March 10th and they'll be hosted by Jimmy Kimmel for the fourth time. All right, now time for On This Day in History. We begin in 1935. Canned beer made its debut on this day. The Gottfried Kruger Brewing Company partnered with the American Can Company to deliver the first 2,000 cans of beer and ale ever to Richmond, Virginia. People were a fan of drinking out of these cans, and so there you have it. In other uh, food and beverage news on this day, Jill, on this day in 1975, the first McDonald's drive through opened up in Siena Vista, Arizona. We told you earlier this week about the big anniversary of that 1984 Apple ad. Well, just a couple days later, 40 years ago today, Apple introduced the Macintosh computer. It went for about $2,500. That would be $7,000 today. With inflation, fast forward 40 years from 1984, uh, that would be $7,000 today. That Macintosh computer featured a nine inch black and white screen and a three and a half inch floppy disk slot. Remember floppy disks? Oh, uh, I sure do, Mosh. To blow on them and then play number munchers or uh, Oregon Trail. Sorry, your entire family got syphilis. (laughs) Mary died (laughs) trying to... Mary died in the river. Start again. (laughs) Some Gen X millennial, elder millennial humor for you folks. And on this day in 2006, Disney announced its purchase of Pixar, the animation studio, for about $7 billion. Just before then, Pixar was crushing it with Toy Story, Bugs Life, Monsters, Finding Nemo, and Disney said, we got to buy it. We end with a bit of music history. On this day in 1941, Neil Diamond was born. So happy birthday to Neil Diamond. He turns 83 years old today. Uh, Speaking of Sunday morning, Jill, there was a powerful story uh, done with him recently. Uh, He's been diagnosed with Parkinson's and starting to feel the effects of it, but did a rare interview recently with CBS Sunday Morning uh, talking about the diagnosis and his career. So check that out over on YouTube. And he sang in, in it, right? It was it was a pretty incredible piece and quite moving. Yeah, Neil Diamond performing for years. Uh, there was the Broadway show recently uh, about his life. And so uh, wishing him a happy birthday on this day. And finally, uh, on this day in 2005, after being out for several years, Britney Spears' album, Oops, I Did It Again, was certified diamond for sales. That means more than 10 million copies sold. That made her the only female artist to reach the milestone on both of her first two albums. And look, Mosh, we managed to get some Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake news in the podcast today. But we kept them apart. We kept them in separate. (laughs) (laughs) We're trying to cross generations here. Charlie Osgood, Neil Diamond, Justin Timberlake, Billy Joel, Britney Spears. 
We got something for everybody here on the pod. All right, a big thank you for listening to the Mo News Podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And review us in the App Store. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.